Welcome into the A-List Podcast. As always, I'm Fonny Lunas, joined by Aishra Blakely and Gary Washburn. Hello, friends. How are you? We are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Kawani Lunas. Every time you say, that sounds so sketchy. That sounds like you're not wonderful, but whatever. Gary, how are you doing? I'm great, Kawani. I'm great. Yeah. Sharad, I'm already tripping, but, you know. Look. We're gonna get I don't know what podcast. you heard about me. He's been talking I'm about here. 50 for the last 50 minutes, and we haven't even been on for 50 minutes. I know, he's been but talking gibberish. We, and seriously, I don't even know what he's talking about at this point. No, but before we no get clue. into... What were you going to say? I said I have no clue what he's talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah let's move forward, please. Yeah. <laughs> Common theme on the pod. <laughs> But before we get into the Celtics, we do want to give some our condolences, at least to Chris Ford, former Celtics player and coach who passed away on Tuesday. He was 74 years old. You, I learned that he was the first player to shoot a three-point shot make in the NBA. Pointer. Make a three-point three shot, shot in the mm-hmm. NBA. But I'm sure you two could enlighten me and the other youngins a little more about how important he was to the Celtics. Well, I mean, he, he, you have to get full history. Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing about him was that he, you know, when you think about the Celtics and you think about just the three point shot, which is so such a part of who they have been for, for so many years. You know, he was the originator. He was the first one to knock that shot down. And, you know, he, he won a championship, you know, with the Celtics. Uh, he's also coached not only in Boston, but he also coached Allen Iverson, another Hall of Famer. Uh, so he, he's I mean, his resume is 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 very lengthy and impressive of what he's been able to do, uh, you know, both as a player and as a coach. Uh, so and certainly, you know, he, he's, he's someone that will definitely be missed by the Celtics family. Yeah. Chris Ford was um, played most of his career in Detroit with the Pistons, um, came to Boston for the last four years of his career and was a starter on the 81 championship team and retired after the 82 season. So he won one championship and he coached the Celtics in a really difficult time. I think that, you know, he ended up with a winning record, but it was a really tough time because it was the end of the big three era. Like, you know, Mikhail and Bird retired under his watch. Uh, Parrish went on, I think, to the Charlotte Hornets after that. Like the big, he, he took over, you know, for Jimmy Rogers, uh, who took over Casey Jones. And it was just a really difficult transition. Uh, he was the coach when Reggie Lewis passed away. So it was a, a lot of just unfortunate things that happened during the Chris Ford area from like the 90 to 95. That was when the Celtics were in real transition. You know, you look at um, the trade in 2013 that sent um, Garnett and Pierce to Brooklyn. And Danny saying that he didn't want to be do what Red Auerbach did and hold on to his great players beyond their prime and then watch the franchise suffer for like 10 years. And that was kind of the example that he pointed out was like Bird got old and had a bad back. You know, uh, Mikhail's feet failed him, started failing him. They got older and, you know, Red had a chance to move, you know, not Bird, but probably Mikhail and didn't and kind of rejuvenate the team. And also the franchise was hurt by the the, the tragic deaths of Lynn Bias and then Reggie Lewis. So, uh, you know, Chris Ford didn't have much of a chance uh, in Boston to coach like a great team. You know, he was, it was the D Brown years, AC Earls and a lot of guys rolling through Boston uh, who, and and and, and D. Brown had a solid career, so nothing against D. Brown, but it was kind of those the, the early '90s, uh, mid '90s Celtics, and then um, ML Carr took over. ML Carr kind of uh, nudged him out, and then took over as coach and GM, and then then Patino. So um, you know, it's it's you look at the Chris Ford era in Boston in terms of a coach, and he just didn't didn't you know, didn't have a chance to coach a, a really great team and was there during a real difficult transition for the franchise. Yeah. Thank you both for sharing that. And now we can pivot to the current Celtics roster, which of course Tatum 29 or more points in this last six of the seven games that they've played. The Celtics still the hottest team in the East right now. 
Jalen Brown's dealing with that abductor. He's been out for the last three games. He's right now listed as questionable for Thursday night's game against the Warriors. Tatum and the rest of the team, who do you two think has been most impressive during this last seven game run? I'm going to say Tatum. Uh, not only is he scoring at a high clip, but he's doing what I would consider making winning basketball plays besides scoring. Uh, he, he's being the leader that so many people have been clamoring for him to be. Uh, and he's doing it not only with his, his, his play, obviously, but I, I think when you're watching them play, there's a, there's a heightened level of vocalization on his part. Uh, and, and, and I think they absolutely need that. They need to know that Tatum is more than just a guy that can go out there and score, that, that he is going to be that voice of the franchise, both with his play and with his word. And I think this seven-game winning streak, I think we've seen a little bit more of that, uh, even when he has not played particularly well. And I had one game uh, that was really just, just a poor shooting game where he had 20 points, which, again, says a lot about Jason Tatum. A horrible game for him is getting 20 points. Uh, he's been incredibly effective, incredibly efficient, and he's been – the type of player that absolutely is an MVP candidate and makes you understand why this Celtics team has the best record in the NBA. Yeah, I'd say Jason, because of his numbers, um, I'm going to pivot though from that. And Jason is tremendous, but you expect that Malcolm Brogdon has been really good in January. Um, You know, the first two games, the Denver Oklahoma city game was not good, but since then, shooting over 50% from the three-point line, being that number three score. Like, um, the thing about the Celtics is that um, we all know that Jason and Jalen are going to be, you know, 30 points and 28 points or whatever they score on any given night. But the question has been, well, who's going to be that number three guy? And Brogdon has stepped up and been that number three guy. 30 points, um, in the game, the first win over Charlotte, 16 in the second, just steady attacking the rim, hitting the three, doing all of what he's supposed to do is that number three score because Marcus has not had a good offensive year. Um, Al, you can't really depend on him to score consistently at age 36. And then Robert is, you know, I think any bucket he gets is kind of a bonus. So they need, you know, and, and then they've had Derek White has had some good games and, and, and and, and uh, he, he has stepped up. But I think Malcolm Brogdon has been really special after a really rough December. December, I think he shot 50% from the three-point line in November, 51, then came back to 34 in December. Now he's back up to 50-something percent uh, from the three-point line in, in January, um, just, uh, just rolling. And I think that you expect Tatum to have 30 points. He gets to the free throw line. He's been tremendous. Well, I'm going to say Malcolm Brogdon because he is, when he can score 16 to 20 points for this team, that just makes him even more dangerous because now he is that number three guy. Because now you don't want Marcus. And that's the thing. When you look at Marcus, I think a, a real thing to, to, to kind of a litmus test for this team is Marcus's shot attempts and Marcus's three point. When Marcus tries to score, then the Celtics are usually struggling, you know, unless he is just on that night. Okay. You don't want Marcus taking 18 shots. You want him taking about 10 to 11 or whatever. Um, and so when Malcolm is scoring, Marcus doesn't need to score. And it's a premium when like, uh, you know, Derek White or Al Horford scores. So I think Malcolm has been to me, the MVP of the month. And that, as much as Jason has put up great numbers, the 51 point game, but I think Malcolm has stepped up ever since the Oklahoma city game, where he told me that they had taken the thunder lightly and they haven't lost since. Um, I think he has been the MVP of the team or the best, most impressive player to me. And I want to kind of expand on Malcolm because he, like you said, he has stepped up for this team. The last two games, he's averaged about 29 five minutes per game. Do you think it's a good thing now that he is ramping up the minutes or is it a little too soon in the season? What do you think, Gary? I think, I think it's fine. I think as long as he stays healthy, um, yeah, I think you want Malcolm to be involved and you want him to play on that, on the floor. Um, you know, because I just think he's one of their steadiest players. I mean, you, you know, I think we're starting to see here like, okay, 
there are some question marks on his roster. Okay. Like Derek White's played well. Can he continue that? Like he's been a little bit up and down. Everybody struggled in December. But Derek White, um, he started to play a little bit better. Stam Hauser is a guy that I don't know now that I, they I think they're asking, can this guy really help us down? He's really struggled since November. And if he can't hit shots, it's really no reason to have him in the game, right? So therefore, you're seeing Peyton Pritchard play more minutes. So I think it's it's a great thing for Malcolm to be steady, Eddie, come off the bench, play those 30, 25 to 30 minutes. Um, he has that defined um, bench role. He's not going to start, you know, even in times, you know, when Derek White's down or whatever, it's going to be Peyton. Uh, when Marcus is hurt, it's going to be Peyton. Like they have said, told him, well, you know, I'm sure they told, you know, Malcolm, you're going to have this defined role. We're not going to change that. And, I, and you're going to play in the fourth quarter, so you're going to finish games, just not start them. So I think it's good for him to be ramping it up. He seems healthy. He's playing uh, some of his best basketball of the season, and they really need it because they need that reliable number three score. If it's not just him all the time, it doesn't have to be. It could be by committee. But I just think it's good that he is reliable and says, hey, I can give you 16 to 20 points a game. That's no problem. And that's what they need. Yeah, I mean, when you when you look at Malcolm and you look at that bench, Malcolm is really the only guy that you can feel confident that one can make a significant contribution night in, night out. And two, if we're being honest and keeping it 100, he really is like having a starter coming off your bench. I don't think the Celtics have a lot of guys that you look and view that they are probably a starter on the majority of the teams in the NBA. I think Malcolm Brogdon is that type of player. And to Gary's point, what he's been able to do, particularly during this seven game winning streak, has been really impressive, She's averaging like close to 19 points, shooting better than 50 percent from the field, better than 50 percent from threes. He's doing the kind of things that make a significant impact and have a, a positive domino effect for the rest of your team, because when he's out there now. Uh, and he's knocking down shots and you've got Tatum out there who, you know, is is going to get a bulk of the attention. He forces you by his impact to either roll the dice and hope that he misses shots, which he's not. Or you start paying a little bit more attention to him and maybe a little less to Jason, which allows Jason to do what he does well, which is get buckets. And so when he's playing the way he has the last six, seven, eight games, it makes the Celtics an even more dominant team and difficult to beat. And obviously, you know, they've, they've had some opponents that aren't the, the, the most, you know, challenging teams in terms of their, their rosters, but that's what the great teams do. You don't take nights off. It goes back to, you know, the conversation Gary had with Malcolm where they, you know, Malcolm basically acknowledged that they took the thunder lightly and they paid a heavy price for that. Great teams don't do that. Great teams, they may not play their A game against every team, but if you're a bad team, and they're playing you, they're going to play well enough to beat you more times than not. They're, even if that's not their best. And, and the Celtics, I think they're still, they're working through that process of figuring out exactly how much of, of them do they have to bring night in, night out. Because you're not going to play your best basketball every night, but you should be able to play well enough to at least compete and against bad teams beat them uh, more times than not. And, and, and Malcolm is part of that, that growth and evolution that we're seeing with the Celtics getting a better sense of what that looks like and how to do that more consistently. Yeah. I like thinking, uh, yeah. I'll read off his last seven games. Uh, we've been talking about it. 18.7 um, points, 55% from the field, 56.8% from the three point line, four rebounds, 3.6 assists, just in a plus minus of eight plus eight. Um, you know, so that's, to me, that's, 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 that's great. Bat 94.7% from the free throw line. So he is killing it right now. 57, almost 57% from three point line in the last seven games. Like that's what they need from him, you know? Um, and I said, he is just, he has just been, uh, uh, tremendous, uh, over the, over this stretch. So as much as we've talked about how Tatum's doing well, Malcolm's coming off and producing off the bench, there still seems to be some kind of hole, something that's missing for the Celtics roster right now. And there have been trade rumors right now that Jacob Pirtle is a potential person that the Celtics are eyeing right now. Do you to buy or sell the fact that he could potentially be on that roster? I'm selling. 
I I I can't I, I I just can't see him coming to Boston. And and the reason why, and, and Gary, you you we've all been through this rodeo enough to know that when there's a specific player that's being talked about a lot mm-hmm. that may become a Celtic, that's almost the first clue that you will get that they're not they're gonna not going to be a Celtic. <laughs> he, he's been a guy that people have talked a lot about, and and the the thing that I keep coming back to with, with him, and again, he's not a bad player. In fact, I think he's a really good player. Uh, not great, but a good player. He's a good player who's good because he plays starter minutes because he's a starter. You're talking about fitting it, it to me. It's like trying to take a really, really big round peg and putting it into a really, really small square hole. Uh, yeah. He is a starter in this league. He's proven himself to be a, a guy that can, can, can do a lot of good things out there. And you're asking him to join a team to be basically their third big. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense for the Celtics because to me, that means just the, you know, uh, the rich are getting richer, but mm-hmm. it doesn't make a lot of sense for him. And, and San Antonio's asking price from uh, two first round picks. I don't think the Celtics value would, Jacob to that extent. And that even if they had sure. the luxury of throwing out a couple of picks to get him, I still don't know if that's going to be an ideal uh, situation unless you know there's some type one of their bigs has a significant injury that changes the, the trajectory of why you would then need him but short of that I don't think you're necessarily going to go there and if we're being honest and keeping it 100 Luke Cornett has been actually relatively decent lately um, he, he looks as though he not he's not going to be you know, you know a starter or anything like that but if you're looking for him to give you five ten good minutes he seems to be capable enough to that challenge Blake yeah, I think um, Daco Pirtle is a good, solid NBA center who is, who's going to do the dirty work in the paint, play defense, get rebounds, score at the rim. I mean, he's exactly what a lot of NBA teams need. But the asking price, I think, is a little too high. And if you look at his salary, there's going to be like you're going to have to give up, you know, maybe obviously going to have to trade Gallinari and then you're going to have to maybe include a Peyton Pritchard or another smaller salary in there uh, for, to make it worth the Spurs while uh, uh, and uh, then all, you know, match salaries, but also the Spurs are trying to rebuild, right? They want young players. So first round picks are what they're going to ask for. And obviously these two teams have made a couple of deals over the last couple of years. Um, you know, they gave, you know, the Spurs uh, take took one of the, uh, Celtics first round picks in the Derek White deal. Um, you know, they made the little minor Noah Vonley deal. So they're used to dealing with each other. But I don't know if Brad Stevens is willing to sacrifice so much uh, for a guy who, you know, could be an impending free agent. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's the thing about it is that um, you, you want a little bit more security. And I also think, quite honestly, they can get something comparable to Pirtle for a smaller asking price. You can get a guy like Nerlens Noel, or you can get a guy who can be athletic and do a little bit of few things for you because you're not going to ask Pirtle to play heavy unless, like you said, bar an injury or you want to save Robert Williams at times and, and you know, uh, let him sit. You're not going to play him extensive minutes. Um, so I think you're going okay as you are now. We've talked about in previous podcasts that they might need somebody with a more meaner streak, a guy who can who can lay some wood in the paint. I think they can really use that, and Pirtle can give that, but I think that's like a high-end kind of price, high-end person, player for what you need for a smaller role. And so I don't think the Celtics are going to balk at that Um unless the asking price goes down and, you know, do you want to give up Peyton Pritchard? Do you want to give up somebody who's, you know, somebody who's important to your team now? Cause you're trying to win it this year. And, you know, you, you can figure out what to do with Peyton next year. You can figure out what to do with, you know, you can, you, you got to load your, your roster, you know, well, you know, Peyton's not going to play. Well, Peyton can fill your role this year. And all you care about right now, is this year. You ain't caring about Peyton in 24, 25. You're caring about Peyton this year. He can give you a role. He can, and he's filling a role right now. 
I think you hold on to him and you try to find something in the buyout market. You try to find a free agent out there. You know, we talked about Dwight Howard, DeMarcus Cousins, you know, even a guy like Hassan Whiteside, who's kind of a mess, but is a big body, um, you know, who's out, who's still out in rel- still relatively young. And I'm not saying go out there and get soft, but there are guys out there that can play that 12 minute a game role and probably get you quality production. I stay away from Hassan. That's just me. Um, I was with you with every one of them names except Hassan. I, I just, mm-mm, no. I take Luke over Hassan. Real talk. I was going to ask what other names do you two think? I mean, we've talked about Melo over the past few weeks. Who do you think the Celtics would realistically look at and try to make an effort to get? See, I don't think that this, the Celtics are going to necessarily target anyone specifically. I think what they're looking to do is get somebody off the buyout market. I think for them, that makes the most sense. Most sense because you've got a roster spot available. Uh, you don't want to radically impact your roster and, 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 and move people that may come in very handy. And I, I just think they're going to find someone who can be a number three uh, center or, or, or they may get someone who can be a, a wing. Cause I still think they could use a little bit of, uh, seasoning at that that backup wing position behind Tatum and, and Brown. I think they could use a player that, that you know, would be perfectly fine going out there playing 10, 12 minutes one night and maybe not playing at all for two or three games. They need someone who has that type of flexibility and be ready when called upon. Uh, and I think they can find that person on the buyout market. I don't think they'd have to necessarily make a trade to get that person. Because, uh, again, the, the, like I said, we talked about this before, but the biggest thing with Pearl is that he's a guy – that is going to want to play significant minutes. And I get it. What you want and what you get aren't always the same. But one of the strengths of the Celtics team is their king chemistry and how everyone is bought into the role that they are being asked and expected to play. And when you go from playing starter minutes, 25, 30 minutes, and then you get traded to a team where they might only need you for 10 to 12 minutes, you may tell yourself you're cool with that. But the reality is, you're probably not cool with that. And so how is that going to, how is that going to impact team chemistry? How is that going to play out? And, you know, and the last point I'll make on this is just that Luke Cornette has not been horrible. I mean, he's been actually relatively decent. And the thing that he's doing more of now, which I couldn't figure out for the life of me why he didn't, was actually look to score when you're wide open near the rim. If you're, if you're a stretch big and they're leaving you wide open from the corner, and you can shoot threes, I don't know. How about shooting a three? He's starting to do more of that, and that, to me, enhances his value and, frankly, makes him more of, of an individual that when he's on the floor, teams have to account for. And that's really all you're looking for with your number three center. Can they, be, can they make an impact, and can they play well enough to where the opponent has to account for their presence? And I think Luke is trending in the right direction uh, in that regard, and, and flip side to that, Sam Hauser is going in the opposite direction in that, in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I think there's guys out there. You know, I'm looking at the list of names here. You know, there's a guy out there like Cody Zeller, you know, another big guy. Uh, you know, I know the Lakers worked him out. And I don't don't think he'd be very popular, but like Myers Leonard, um, Derek Favors just signed with the Hawks. I thought that was a, a be somebody that they really could bring in. Willie Cauley Stein, you know what I'm saying? Like there are guys out there that are capable big men who have played in the league, played a lot of minutes in the league. They can give you a little bit of production that you need and put you over the top. And like Sherrod said, I don't think Luke Cornett's played badly at all. Uh, can he, you know, but do you want security at that position? Yeah. Do you want a guy? I mean, I think a Willie Cauley Stein is a guy who is going to fall in with the team concept. He doesn't seem like a bad guy. I know, you know, he, he didn't really fulfill his potential. I know he's a lottery pick and, or whatever. And, and people thought he'd be kind of a, be, a much better player, but he's, he's serviceable. Right. And that's all you're looking for at this point. Uh, depending on what you are willing to give up. So, uh, you know, I think they have some options. I think that they can wait for the buyout market. They can see which teams are looking to rebuild or retool. Uh, but the, the one thing these teams are going to want is first-round picks. 
Like that's a good and Brad's shown the willingness to give up first round picks, but do you want to keep giving up first round picks and kind of ruin your, you know, chance at, at getting bringing in more good young players? I don't know about that. Well, I feel like we always have this one of our other partners set up right after we talk about the lack thereof on these rosters. So if you have a roster of small business and you're looking to hire, no one has a business like yours with all its strengths and challenges to succeed. You're going to need a hiring partner that adapts to your needs. You need Indeed. Indeed is a hiring platform where you can attract, interview and hire all in one place. So instead of spending hours on multiple job sites, searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. With their instant match tool, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed match their job description the moment they sponsor a job. One of the things that we love about the fact that Indeed has the instant match is that when you're looking to sponsor a post in the U.S., you're actually three times more likely to get a hire. And once again, that hire is usually going to be more qualified than the other people that are even in the pool. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. So if all of that sounds ideal for your small business or business in general, you can start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash A-list. Offer good for a limited time. You can claim, once again, that's a $75 credit for your business now at indeed.com slash a list indeed.com slash a list terms and conditions apply need to hire you need indeed coming up for the Celtics a fun game a rematch of the NBA finals of course the Golden State Warriors are in town on Thursday I must note that they were actually just at the White House giving the president and vice president of Jersey. And of course, you know, doing the, the picture taking thing. So they're coming off of a really big high of remembering their championship, which I think is going to make the game even more exciting, but they are still currently six in the West right now. Who do you think needs this win the most between golden state and Boston, Boston, Boston. I, okay. I, Golden State, listen, when you've won multiple chips, you don't really care what your record is. You don't they really don't care who beat you in the regular right. season. Because you know at the end of the day, it's you about still the are going to be that dude when it comes to getting a chip. You know that you have the wherewithal to be the last team standing. Whereas if you're the Celtics, it feels as though you've got some demons you need to exercise with these Golden State Warriors. You need to... You, I, I, I think that... You know you're as good as they are in many respects, but you haven't shown it when it matters, obviously, in the finals. And you haven't shown it even the next best thing to when it matters, which is the regular season. So I think the Celtics need this one just simply from a confidence standpoint. And I think, again, to add a little bit more of validation, I think, mentally, that they are the team that everyone in the NBA is chasing this year. Yeah, I think the Celtics need, need this win much more. You know, the Warriors are starting to get things a little, together a little bit. They beat Washington. Um, you know, they, lost, they they they're really really up and down, but now they got Curry back. Clay Thompson's going to play, so it's going to be the old game. I think um um Iguodala and Kaminga aren't playing, but um it's going to be pretty much the whole game. Um and they know they're in the Celtics heads. And uh, and then Wiggins is back too. Good Wiggins didn't play in that first matchup with the Celtics when the Warriors pretty much uh, spanked them. So I think the Celtics have to realize, like, okay, this is a team that that mentally we need. This is a roadblock we need to get over, and you know we need to be ready, prepared. Uh, obviously, after this is an important game, a three game road trip to Toronto, um, Orlando, and Miami. So I think that this continue should continue their surge. Uh, but you're right, Sherrod's right. The pressure's on the Celt, all on the Celtics here. National TV game, the Celtics' best team in the league. Yeah. If they turn around and lose the Warriors at home, people are like, well, you know, we don't good? know. Yeah, they we don't ready. know. <laughs> so, so I think the pressure's on Boston. You know, both teams, plenty of d- days off. Uh, each team last played on Monday, so no, there's no, be no back-to-back yeah. excuses or got limits, limits or anything they like that. play that out. 
They the yeah. league knew what they were doing with that one. So they know these two, two teams. You know, I said I think the Warriors are going to play their best ball because that's what they do when the when the lights are bright. But they've also looked really bad this year. They lost to the Bulls a couple of nights ago. They lost at home to the Magic, like the Celtics did. They lost at home um, to the Pistons. The Sherrod's favorite, you know, Sherrod's Pistons. My Beat guys, the 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 beer. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, to me, they're beatable. This is not the twenty one twenty two Warriors. But then again. They're still in your heads. You still have to make the plays to win the game, figure out what you're going to do, how you're going to guard Curry. You know, Clay's going to be on fire. Draymond's going to be said he's ready now for the crowd. He ain't going to get caught off guard by all the stuff. He's going to the stuff so obviously they know, and it's a big game for the Warriors too. National TV, Everybody's counting them out already. You know, they, they, they look really bad this year. So what more better better way to, than to, to beat up uh, the best team in the league and, and head, you know, continue your road trip? Yeah. And the, the other point about this Golden State team, there's only one team out west that is a crappier road team than Golden State, and that's Houston. And in this day and age, when you are in the same company as the Houston Rockets, there's nothing really good about that. Uh, so for the for the Celtics, you're playing a team that has consistently been at their worst in these type of environments. Uh, and uh, again, they're, they're the defending champs. And we know when that bell rings for the playoffs, they're going to be ready to roll. But until then, you need to take advantage of them when they maybe not be at the top of their game strength wise. And obviously they got some bodies back. Uh, but from a mental standpoint, Golden State still seems to be just kind of finding itself uh, in the regular season. And if you're the Celtics, you've got to make the most of that opportunity, particularly when you're playing in your building. Uh, and, you and, you know, whether you have Jalen Brown back or not, this is a game you should win. It's, it's that simple. You should win this game. Uh, and it's just a matter of, of doing what you're supposed to do and, and hopefully moving the needle a little bit closer to exercising that, that Golden State demon that's always that that's been in your head right now for a while. Well, clearly their road record is not of a concern for the Celtics, but what is from your two perspective, the most concerning thing that the Celtics should be looking out for in this game? Um, I would say control what you can control. Uh, and it's, it's coach speak. I know, but, one of the things the Celtics do, it feels as though when they lose to teams like Golden State, it's not necessarily what Golden State does, but it's what the Celtics don't do. It's it's them not handling the ball as well as they should. It's, it's Jason Tatum missing wide open shots. It's, you know, turnovers that aren't even forced turnovers. It's like literally just guy inbounds the ball and throws it over guy's head and it's a turnover. The little things that they have control over, they need to make sure that they maintain that control and don't allow the game to get out of control. If they, if they do that, they'll position themselves to win this game, which I think they will. Uh, but, but again, control what they can control. I, I think that's the big concern if you're the boss and Celtics going into this game. Yeah. I think the concern for the Celtics is just the Thompson Curry dynamic, just, you know, raining threes, getting hot Curry yeah. going for 50. Like that's the thing. Curry's going to show his best. He's healthy. Now Thompson's coming up. Thompson did not play on Monday. So he's coming off, I think four days off. So he'll be fresh and ready. Draymond, like, I just think the aura of the Warriors, the, the the whole fact that when they play well, they can play really well. And when they don't, they don't. And, and that's what the point that what they're at right now. And so I, I think the Celtics have to, have to be aware defensively. Don't get into a shootout. Like the last couple of games against Charlotte. Now, well, I'd say the, the, the Saturday game was Charlotte. They just, they, they let the Hornets get really hot early and then they end up, end up having to fight them off and, and kind of they, their defense kind of took over the second half. But you can't let that, you know, you can't allow 42 points in the first quarter or Curry to go for five, three. Like you got to lock down immediately. Focus. This is the game you need your, your utmost focus on defensively. And I ain't worried about the offense with the Celtics. They'll score. It is the, the offense, the defense. You know, get in guys' faces. You know, don't do the drop coverage against Curry and Thompson. That doesn't seem to work very well. 
Um, obviously, there's a difference now. Robert Williams is not playing that first matchup. He'll he'll be present in, in logging minutes. So um, we'll see what happens uh, and how focused they come out for this, as opposed to like, hey, let's play, let's play, you know, shoot them up, let, you know, pop a shot, and let's all just make shots, and then hopefully we're the ones that keep making shots. Like that's not the way to win. That's how they beat Charlotte. And they let Charlotte get comfortable. You cannot let the Warriors get comfortable. It could be a long night. So, like I mentioned earlier, we're still unsure as to whether or not Jalen will even play in this game. Who do you think from the Celtics roster needs to step it up for this game? What do you think, Gary? Jason Tatum. I mean, there's Wiggins, right? That's the dude who shut you down. So Yeah. I should have said other than Tatum because y'all always put pressure on this man. Give, give me another one. Yeah. I'm not gonna pick Tatum. Gary, no, okay. I'm gonna say Tatum else. because Tatum, right, Tatum had a bad finals. That. Tatum had a bad first game in in San Francisco. That's All bad. right, Jason, what's up? You coming up a 51 point <laughs> game? Like, what you got? And this is one of those games. All the MVP voters will be watching. What you got, Jay? You know, are you an MVP? Are you gonna carry your team to a win? Pressure is on Tatum. I'd say him without question. <laughs> There's definitely, you know, Tatum's going to have to play better than we, he did in the finals, obviously. But here's the thing. When you go through the just what they went through in the NBA finals and you come back the following year, you're going to make some changes that will hopefully position you to get over that hump going forward. And one of those additions that the Celtics made was Malcolm Brogdon. I think he's going to have to continue to play at the level we've seen the last six, seven, eight games for them to have a legitimate shot at winning. Because when you think about that title that Golden State won, as great as Steph Curry was, and he was, there were a number of players along that journey who were not nearly as impactful over the course of that series as Steph was, but they had moments where they stepped up and carried the load and catapulted this team to success and victory. And I think that that Malcolm Brogdon is going to have to be that guy in this game, not only because of the need for the Celtics to have a number three steady type score but with Jalen Brown's status you know uncertain he may have to be the next best score to Tatum out there and he has shown the ability to do that Gary went through the numbers he's been shooting better than 50 percent from the field and from three-point work range 90 plus percent from the free throw line uh, over the last seven games that they all Celtics win but they're going to need him to continue in that vein in order for this team to really really have the opportunity to, again, exercise that Golden State demon that I think is inside them and inside their heads based upon what happened in the finals last year. And also, as Gary alluded to, what happened last standing around Golden State, where Golden State wasn't even whole, as whole as they are now. And they they pretty much had their way in that game. So uh, lots of things for the Celtics to build on uh, in this game and hopefully find a way to, to break through and get what I think is a much-needed victory over a team that has had their number. So speaking of number, uh, how about saving a little bit of money? Uh, our good friends at Rocket Money have just the plan for you. Are you wasting money on subscriptions? 80% of people have subscriptions that they totally forgotten about. Maybe for you, it's an unused Amazon Prime account or a Hulu account that never gets streamed. Well, there's this great app that helps you track all of your expenses. And because of it, you no longer would waste money on subscriptions you don't even use. You might have heard of it. It's called Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill. Uh, do you know you much? Uh, do you know how much you, your subscriptions really cost? A lot of people think it's just like 80 bucks, but it's no, it's closer to 200. And that's right, 200 bucks. You could be wasting hundreds of dollars of dollars every single month for subscriptions you don't even know exist. Uh, there's this app that you would love to get a hold of and use that takes care of that for you. And that is called Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill. And the app shows you all your subscriptions in one place and then cancels for you whatever you don't still want. And I know this for a fact because I have been using Rocket Money for the last couple of months uh, and it works perfectly. I've been able to get a much clearer read on what my bills are, uh, when they're due, and, may, and maybe most important, 
get rid of some that I don't even want to have that I completely forgot about. So it's amazingly awesome in that regard. And the cancel subscription is really simple. All you have to do is press cancel and rocket money takes care of the rest. So get rid of use of subscriptions with rocket money. Now go to rocketmoney.com slash a list. Seriously. It can save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash a list. Cancel your unnecessary subscriptions right now at rocketmoney.com. Well, that is my show. But we're wrapping it up because we just talked about the Warriors looking ahead to next week. Do you two have anything fun on your agenda? Chill, you know, what's going on? <laughs> no, just uh just again that's locking in on this. This is a really big game. I mean, that it is, is. It's a big game. And that's kind of where my head's at. And, I've, and, and you know, the, the road trip they got coming up isn't as star-studded heavy as some of the, the road trips of the past. But this is an important stretch because we're, we're nearing the, the home stretch towards the All-Star break. And the Celtics want to continue playing well. Uh, when playing well doesn't mean you'll win every game, but they're, they're starting to build the kind of habits that they hope will carry on into the playoffs so that if they have a slip up every now and then, it won't be something that is significant. It'll just be one of those nights. So, but... Golden State is a really, really big deal, really big game for the Celtics for so many reasons. And we'll be covering that, you know, wall to wall between now and, and the game tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Washburn. Uh, yeah, I'll be looking forward to the game and to the Celtics over the next couple of weeks. I know the Los Angeles Lakers come in uh, next week and LeBron chasing the, the record, uh, you know, the scoring record. Uh, he won't, you know, be close to reaching it. Uh, when they come come to Boston, but we'll see if Anthony Davis is back for that game. Maybe he's uh, recovering enough to be back for that game. But some important games, sort of. For all, but as I said, uh, the, the Celtics have some winnable games in this stretch. You know, I know they got Philly and they got Brooklyn, but they also got Detroit. You know, uh, Sherrod's favorite team, Detroit. They got Charlotte again. Um, sure, our second favorite team, Charlotte, right? Yeah, Charlotte. They have yeah, right. uh, they have a, a, a opportunity to build some real distance between them, the Nets, and the Bucks. If you look at their schedule, uh, let me read their schedule till the All Star break here. Um, Golden State, Toronto, losing record. Orlando, losing record. See if they can get revenge on the on the uh, Magic. At Miami, a very tricky game. Then the Knicks come in, the Lakers, Brooklyn, Phoenix Suns, if they're going to be healthy. Then Detroit and Philadelphia, Charlotte, Memphis, and Milwaukee. Be the two real doozies um, over two days. Uh, and then they end the first half or the unofficial first half with the Pistons again. So two games against the Pistons, a game against Charlotte. You know, you got Phoenix, you got Orlando, Toronto. There's some winnable games here. For the Celtics to, you know, I'd be shocked if they won all these games, you know, because obviously you got Milwaukee and Memphis and Brooklyn and and the Lakers and the Knicks, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give them, we'll push them too. But there's a chance for the Celtics to put to string together some wins here and to really put some distance between them, the Nets and the Bucks, because the the Nets are dealing with some injuries. The Bucks, you know, I, I know Giannis and Middleton both missed. Uh, the other game the other night against Toronto Raptors. And they're, 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 I know Drew Holiday is kind of saving them right now. So if you're the Celtics, a real chance to build some wins. And, hey, the Warriors are a team they should beat, so it should start on Thursday. And since you mentioned the All-Star game, I do want to kind of update our followers, which I'm sure they saw by now, but – Jason Tatum's bumped up to three in the front court for the Eastern Conference. And Jalen Brown is still at number four with over a million votes for an all-star appearance this year. So obviously that's just the fan vote. There'll be other things that are accounted for. But it's good to know that the Celtics will have at least two people in there this year. And from my perspective, non-basketball related, but New England sports related, 80 for Brady. I am actually going to watch that this evening because you know, my media duty calls. So I will give you guys a review as to whether or not it's a, a good movie and worth watching, but that's something you keep an eye on for on NBC. I'm glad you, I'm glad you're going to go see that movie, Connie. I, I no, saw no, no, no. It's, it's a screener. I get to watch it at home. So I'm watching it for work and then I'm going to be interviewing oh. someone. Yeah. Oh. 
I'm interviewing Why that. someone from the cast. But it's not Jane Fonda, so I'm like, hmm. Lily Tomlin? <laughs> none of them. It's none of the women. I'm like, what am I doing here? Oh, you got an all-star that's... cast of women acting in this movie, and I don't even get to talk to them. Wow. <laughs> But I'm grateful. I'm gonna get to. I'm gonna watch it again. I'll still give y'all a review, and we'll see. I got we'll an see email. How I got an email <laughs> last week for an opportunity to interview the great Frankie Faison. If you don't know who Frankie Faison is, first of all, I'm the president of Frankie Faison fan club. Oh, Frankie are you? Faison was the dude in Coming to America who said, "Damn shame what they did to that dog." Oh like, my god! He's from the wire. Like he is such a great like. I, yes, I have I no know, reason yes. to interview. I have no reason to interview Frankie Fives. Um, besides she being a big, did it. I did, I have not returned an email yet. But I'm just trying to figure out how to get the basketball related or something. Get a good like, angle. I like, can get an angle because I mean that's my main man. I love nah, Frankie Fives. Damn they shame what they did to that dog. Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, the, the, one of the more classic lines from Coming to America. One of my favorite. Uh-huh. All time like character actors, like you know, he's in the Y, he's been a mm-hmm. lot of a lot of things over the years. Uh, so yeah, just speaking of that, I got an opportunity. Like, I have, I might have to return that email and just have a conversation yeah. with my man Frank. Yeah, see what he likes. Yes. Learn about him. Hopefully you never know what will come up. Hopefully he's a basketball fan. I'll, I'll try to tie it in somewhere. Okay. It's people you like that when you're like, looking at him. Yeah. yeah, you should. I'm looking at his wiki and it's one he seems like he has been underrated his entire career. Oh, totally, like he totally. All these iconic I'm type roles. And, Frankie flies on right, look. I love that guy. We're looking forward to that interview. Okay. We're going to have a check-in with us next okay. week. <laughs> yeah, But that's all for you. the A-list this week. Of course, thank you again to Indeed.com. Of course, Rocket Money. Make sure you use those promo codes if you end up signing up for any of those accounts. It's going to be a good one on Thursday. So we're all, of course, looking forward to that one. But until then, for the A-List Podcast, I'm Kwani Lunas, H.R. Blakely, Gary Washburn. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week.